Hey everyone, and welcome to Protea Valley Church at Home. It's so great to see you. If this is one of the first times you're joining us, an especially warm welcome to you. Uh, we love having visitors. Just please take a little bit of time to scan the QR code that's on the screen right now, and someone from Protea Valley Church will get in touch with you in the next few days. If you'd like to know any more about our church, please go to our website, and that's www.proteavalleychurch.org. So we've got a great service planned for today. Uh, we're going to worship together, we're going to pray together, we're going to hear God's Word read to us, and then we're going to hear our latest sermon from our series called Scattered. Uh, but before we do any of that, I would love to pray for us. Father God, just thank you for another opportunity for us to draw together. I ask that you would focus us on how great you are and how merciful you are towards us. We see that in particular where we think of Jesus coming to earth, living the perfect life and dying for us and bringing us freedom and liberty and connection with you, Father. I just ask that your Holy Spirit would make those truths of who you are and what you have done for us very real to each one of us who is watching this today. Amen. Right, we're going to go into a time of worship now. And remember that worship always starts with who God is, how great He is, and how much love He has showed to us. And I just want to encourage you to take this next song just as an opportunity to respond to who He is and His mercy towards us. I am a city on a hill. I am a light in the darkness. Jesus living in me can change the world. I am a city on a hill. I am the light in the darkness. Jesus living in me can change the world. Let my light shine, let my light shine, let my light shine. Let my light shine, let my light shine, let my light shine.
So at Protea Valley Church, we are passionate about prayer. Uh, we want to be a church that prays often. We want to be a church that prays well, that prays uh, Jesus-honoring, gospel-centered prayers. Uh, we're also very aware that even though we are a church, there are many other churches uh, in our city, in our country, and in the world. And we want to be praying for those churches. Uh, so today I asked one of my friends who's a leader at another church to pray for us. And I'm hoping this is going to inspire us to not only pray for ourselves, pray for other issues in the world, uh, but to pray for other churches, for their people, uh, for their leaders, and for their missions going forward. So here's Reino saying a special prayer for Protea Valley Church today. Hi, Protea Valley Church. And it's an honor for me just to be able to share a prayer with you or pray over you. Um, from our campus here in Friedekloof, we had the Friend of God Church, I'm Reino, and I was just reading through Matthew 11, and it says, Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And I think we, a lot of time, affiliate the scripture with people that's, that is broken, that's outside in the world, but God is actually telling us, for us who has been laboring in ministry to come and rest. And I just pray for a time of rest for you guys, especially for your leadership, and that you would experience God in this time and be still in front of Him. So I just want to say a, pray, a prayer over you. Father, I just want to pray for our family out in Pratia Valley, Lord, that you would really just show them your heart and your love towards them, Father, and in their community as well. And for the leadership, I really pray, Lord, that you would take that burdens that they have, and if they are laden, that you would come and you would restore and refresh them completely in this time after they have labored. Father, I just pray as well that your spirit will come and inspire the people's heart there to reach their community, those around them, as they are in a, on, on a hill and they are literally a city on you lord that their light will shine to a world that is broken around them and we pray it in jesus name amen hope you have a fantastic sunday be blessed so in the book of acts all of these different disciples went in to various places to go spread the good news of jesus behind me you can see a group of intrepid explorers uh, we're never meant to do these things alone. And so the disciples went off in groups in different communities, uh, each of different skill sets that they brought to the mix. And it's true for us too that uh, the gospel is best done in a team uh, together. This is why we're going to be putting a huge amount of effort into our midweek communities, our connect groups, our life groups. We really believe that whilst Sunday is important for the church to gather, to sing God's praises, to hear scripture read and preached, we also understand that the real disciple making happens on the ground around briars and dining room tables where disciples gather together, encourage each other, and then draw others in. People often belonged before they believed. And in time, as they came to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, they then went and passed that good news message on to others and drew them back into community. And so we want to build a multiplying group of communities that will ultimately change our valley, our city, and hopefully in time, the world. That's our hope and our dream. So blessings from the Fish River Canyon. Uh, let's hear God's word read and preached to us. Good morning church. So I've just come back from the Fish River Canyon hike as you would have seen on the little video clip. Uh, phenomenal time to spend outdoors with people. On my back I had this backpack with a whole bunch of equipment in it. Sleeping mat, sleeping bag, stove, food, water, clothes, jackets, all the things that we need. But one of the most important things that I had on the hike was a cool team to enjoy it with and to look after each other because you're far from cell phone connection and we are meant to do those kind of things together. In fact, the best adventures in life are shared with other people. And this was true for the early church and it should be true for us as well. So we're going to turn to Acts in a moment and we're going to look at two little snapshot pictures, one out of Acts chapter 2, one out of Acts chapter 4. Uh, the Apostle Luke is writing this uh, giving some early church history, a sense of a bit of a snapshot of the early life of the church. And I'm sure there's a whole lot that we're going to do well to learn out of this today. So let me pray. Let's read scripture and I'll preach. Father and Son and Spirit, thank you so much for the beauty of scripture, for the testimony that Acts contains of the early church and its life. I pray that as we read today, that you would teach us some things about our ancestors in the faith and that we would learn again some of the ancient rhythms that I believe you are calling us to go back to in this season. And so we ask your blessing now as we turn to Scripture, 
guide our hearts and our minds as we read through it and then apply it to our lives, we pray. And we ask this in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. So as you read through the scriptures, it's very difficult to imagine Christian life on its own. Everywhere we turn, we see these small communities of faith that are flourishing, being planted, growing, sending out others. They're establishing these small communities of faith. In fact, this is what Jesus did right in the beginning. Drew 12 people alongside of him, spent three years plowing into their lives. Day after day, they watched him do ministry in the marketplace, watched him engage with different kinds of people from different cultures saw him perform miracles, learn from him. Uh, in the evenings, they would have sat and debated with him the implications and the meaning of all of these things. And in time, Jesus would send them out. And this early group that Jesus pulled together became the very core of the first church. And in these two sections of scripture, we get a bit of a snapshot of what the church looked like. So for us in the season, we, we have a phenomenal base on which to platform our church work going on post-COVID. We have about 52 midweek communities when we can. Outside of COVID, we gather well and we do Sundays really well. But this is a season where I think God is going to press in on us to do some things slightly differently. And one of the important things that we want to shift in the life of this church over the next season is the truth that while Sundays are important, Sundays are not everything. And yet the modern church has made Sunday almost everything. And we want to plow into our midweek communities. We believe that community is central to who God is. All right, Father, Son, Spirit, constant connection, constant community. We believe community is central to how the church is meant to live its life. And I would argue that we can't really do community on Sunday. Community is something we do in homes. And that's what we see in the snapshot of the early church. And so we want to move away from an idea of saying, I went to church this morning to a much more gospel based, much more biblical idea of I opened my home to God's people and to others. And we were the church today. So in Acts, what we see is a church not abandoning their form of worship. They, they were Jews. They went to the temple courts, verse 46 says. They continued to meet together in the temple courts. They did the Jewish worship. They listened to the rabbi's teaching. They sung the Psalms together. They, they didn't abandon the history, but what they added to it was a new kind of community that shaped absolutely everything. And now the way the modern church gathers has made it seem like Sunday is everything. We want to return to these ancient rhythms. We're not saying Sunday is not important. We're saying Sunday is not everything. For a lot of you, the way you operate is you go to church, you, uh, you sit there for a while, listen to some songs sung, you don't even sing, you listen to a preacher preach, and you go home and your life continues on as it always did. And we want to change this. And so what we see is Jesus creating this incredibly powerful community. And what we see at the end of it is that they enjoyed the favor of all the people and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. What Jesus put in place is a radical new community that radically changed their lives and then radically affected the city in which they lived. And it would seem that in the disconnected world in which we're currently living, we desperately need a deeper form of community. 
So Grant and I were talking this week how it's become easier for us just to WhatsApp or send a message to somebody rather than calling them or rather than seeing them. And yet in our hearts we both realize that we're desperately in need of deeper human connection. And I think many of you are feeling that same pressure. We're all worried, some level of anxiety about COVID and about affecting others and being infected by others. And so we find ourselves isolating, but we find ourselves also desperately in need of connection with people. And this is how Jesus intended people to operate. And if we're going to see our lives transformed, if we're going to see our city renewed, if we're going to see our friends want to Jesus, it's going to happen through small gospel shaped communities. We talk often about the gospel, this good news message about Jesus, that Jesus lived the perfect life we will never live. And he died the death we rightfully should die. And it's not just that Jesus gave us a message to proclaim to the world. Jesus created a new kind of community that lived out the message. And I think this is where often modern churches fall really short. I spoke last week about the gospel message being a roadmap that gave the church its purpose and its direction. It shaped everything that the church did. It shaped the way they thought. It shaped the way they acted. It shaped the way they saw themselves. And it should do the same for us. The gospel changes everything. So here's what today's going to be a little bit like. Imagine heading down to the gym. You haven't been for months because of COVID. You've been doing no exercise. You've been lying on your couch. You've been guzzling all the junk food. Your middle has expanded a few belt notches. And now you head down to the gym and it's your first gym session. And if you've got anywhere near a halfway decent personal trainer, they're not going to make you go and do weights immediately. They're going to do some limbering up. They're going to get you to stretch those muscles that have been inactive. And so I want you to allow yourself to be stretched a little bit because what I want to do is just show you a couple of little photographs, so to speak, out of Acts, show you a little bit what it looked like when this ancient church met. And hopefully I'm praying that God would do something in you, stir something in you that would long for us to reflect that kind of community to the world. Not just saying here is Jesus who died to save you, but living out that gospel good news message in the way that we do things. And so we're going to have to stretch ourselves a little bit. So here are some of the snapshots out of that album. They were of one heart and one mind. They were of one heart and one mind. The early church was single-minded in its focus on Jesus. Everything revolved around Jesus. Everyone's lives revolved around Jesus. He was the central figure who gave their lives substance and purpose and meaning. And I guess one of the tensions that certainly Grant and I have been feeling over the last couple of years is that there is a lot of busyness around the life of the church. And by God's grace, a lot of it is good gospel busyness. But so much of our energy gets sapped away in doing things that are not really about Jesus. And we want to be a church that is single-minded in our attention, being focused on him who died to save us, him who was raised again on the third day, he who is alive and working in our midst. And we as the church want to be single-minded about that focus. Number two, we see that they built into their lives spiritual rhythms. Not just going to temple on a Sunday, but the Bible tells us that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They prayed together. They worshipped together. They broke bread together in each other's homes. Okay, let me say this. Some of you, your Christian faith is a very private form of faith. You occasionally attend worship, you don't really talk to anybody, you go home and you have this very privatized individualistic faith. This is nothing at all like what the early church lived out. This church was gathered in each other's homes. They were connected to each other and sharing life together. They were praying with each other and they were praying for each other. They were praising God together, debating through scripture together, breaking communion together. Not trying to make you feel guilty, but when was the last time you sat and prayed with someone? Husbands and wives, when last did you sit down together and pray together? When last did you pull your children around you and lay hands on them and pray with them and pray for them? What I believe God is calling us into in this current season, as everything is being shifted, as the world is changing, I believe God is calling us to return to our ancient roots to tread out those ancient paths of the good news of the gospel. This community just lived differently because of their interaction with Jesus. Number three, 
they opened their homes. They opened their homes and they shared meals. Hospitality is one of the most powerful tools at our disposal. And we're, we're asking you to open your home in this next season. I'm not just talking about inviting people around for a dinner. I'm talking about intentionally inviting people around for a dinner. Opening your home up to people of different languages, of different cultures, of different colors, of different religions. And then you as a family, before your guests arrive, you gather around together and you pray that God would do something in this meal, he would do something in your community, in your fellowship together, where he would make himself known. I'm not talking about inviting friends over, okay, and having some sort of little scripted message, like, okay, Johnny, you say that, and when you say that, I'll come in with this gospel thing. I'm not talking about that kind of weirdo kind of thing. I'm simply saying that you intentionally invite people around and pray that God would do something in the midst of this. This is what the early church did, was they opened their homes to each other's, and then to those outside of the faith. And it says that they won favor with the people and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Fourth thing we see is that the early church was marked by radical generosity coupled with radical vulnerability. So on one hand, there must have been a safe space for people to stick up their hands and say, I have need, I'm, I'm in trouble, my business is not doing well, I need money. And then others in that same community, because they knew each other and they were connected in relationship with each other, were moved by the Spirit of God to then give up land, sell it off, and then give the money to those who had need. There is something powerful about a community that is saturated in the Spirit. And these kind of things cannot easily happen on a Sunday. This happens midweek community as we share lives together in each other's homes. Listen, I've... I've been serving here at Prodi Valley uh, for many years now. I think this is year 15. I have lived in this community for almost my entire life. I went to Kenridge Primary School and Fairmont High School. I know this neighborhood well. We're a, a great community, but we're also a wealthy community. And one of the things that wealth does is it allows us to plaster over our lives and hide all the cracks and flaws and to pretend like it's all okay. This is, this is when people come to your house for a braai and you pack everything into the cupboards and you wipe the countertops down and you make the kids pack away all their nonsense and you present this facade. And yet what we seem to see in Acts is not not that, but this authentic, vulnerable church expressing their needs and the mess of their lives and others responding with radical generosity. Over the last couple of months, I've heard several incredible stories coming out of our midweek communities. As people were able to find safe space to be vulnerable, they spoke something of the need with which they have and others have responded with powerful, powerful testimonies. Of, of how God had saved their lives and that is encouraged and then at other points people have simply responded by saying I have more than I need here take something to, for yourself and it's just been phenomenal to hear those stories I want to hear more of those stories as our midweek communities are shaped to look more and more like acts I imagine that for some of you uh, you're feeling the burn right you've you've not used these muscles in a while, the thought of opening your home up to your neighbors or to strangers just pushes you way outside of your comfort zone. The thought of being vulnerable and expressing your needs to a bunch of people is just terrifying for you. The thought of giving up some of your hard-earned money to bless others makes you deeply uncomfortable. When we talk about spiritual disciplines like praying together and breaking bread together and singing together, some of these things, I, I I understand this. I understand that these things may make you feel a little uncomfortable. I guess I'm trying to encourage you today to look at the snapshot of what our early ancestors in the church looked like, to listen to the voice of the Spirit, and then to allow God to shape you into a gospel community. If we do not get the community thing right, we're going to fail. We're going to fail at being the church Jesus wants us to be. You see, when a community meets in this authentic, vulnerable space, when they worship God together, God does something. God shows something of God's character through that community. As they were saturated in the Spirit, something of the very character of God began to be reflected by the way they treated each other. This is what happens when we spend time with God. When we spend time, it happens to me all the time. When we spend time with friends, we begin to pick off them some of their things, their habits, their languages, their preferences. This is what happens when we spend time with God. 
And so what we find is that people often think that God is condemning. But when they come in contact with a community that is gracious and forgiving, they begin to experience something of the beauty of the God who is a forgiving God. People often think that God expects them to live perfect lives before he will accept them. When they come in contact with a godly community that is gracious, that is gentle with people and their failures and nurtures them up towards righteousness, they will come to experience something of the beauty of the gracious God who gives unconditional grace to those who cannot earn it and who do not deserve it. People often come to God thinking that he is distant, but when they connect with a community that is there, that is present, that is involved in each other's lives, that are prepared to get involved in the mess of normal life, they would come to know the God who is ever present. People often think that when the world is bad and when things are hurting that God does not care, but when they engage with a community who genuinely cares, not just by throwing money at the problem, although that money is sometimes really helpful, right? But when they engage with a community that gets involved in their lives and genuinely shows them care and compassion and empathy, they will come to know that the God whom we worship is a gracious, compassionate and kind God. This is what Jesus gave birth to. A community of people whose lives were so transformed by Jesus and by the good news about him that they began to live differently. They won the favor of the people and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Someone once said to me, and I think this is a truth, that the only Bible some people will ever read will be you. As the church in Acts, in all the places that it was planted, lived out the good news, people were intrigued, people began to belong before they believed, and then something happened and the church grew wildly. And so the whole book of Acts is a story about how the church was planted in Jerusalem, how it spread throughout Judea, then around the Mediterranean, down into North Africa, and then finally was taken to the very ends of the earth. God, living through his people, created this incredible new kind of community. And that is what I'm really hoping God is going to change in us in this season. We have so much good stuff happening in the life of this church. So many great midweek communities. I think God is asking us to step our game up. God is asking some of you to step outside of your comfort zones and your isolation and your security to open your home, to open your cupboards and invite people in and prepare meals and create space for God's people and for those who are not yet God's people to come and meet and to see what authentic Christian community looks like. And they won favor with all the people and God added to their number daily those who were being saved. That's what I'm hoping God is going to do in this season. Let's pray. Father, Son, and Spirit, thank you so much for what we see in Acts. I know that what we've read is going to stretch a bunch of people. For some people, the thought of praying with others and for others is terrifying. For some, the thought of opening their homes up and inviting people to share a meal is a, a very far way outside of their comfort zones. But I believe, Jesus, that community, genuine, authentic, messy community, seems to be the way that you have chosen to make the good news message known to the world. Not a bunch of perfect people, but a bunch of flawed people sharing life together, saturated Jesus by you and by your Holy Spirit. And something about the way that that community gathered changed the world. Help us shift our mindset away from Sunday somewhat. Father, show us that Sundays are important, but they cannot be everything. Help us to step out of these comfort zones, out of these little walls that we've built around ourselves. Father, help us to become this community that you started, Jesus, right back in the very beginning, and you would want to continue in this season. COVID has shifted a bunch of things for us, Lord. We're uncertain about what the future looks like, but I'm convinced that somehow in the uncertainty of the season, you're going to change some things in us, and I pray that you would do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Spoken word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so good. Serve it, still you give yourself away.
Valley Church. Uh, so on a Sunday morning, we normally spend a bit of time talking about some of the ministries that we invest into as out of the life of the church, but we don't often talk about ministry in the church. Uh, and so normally at this point in the service, we talk about tithes and offerings, and there will be a QR code, which will appear on the screen a little bit later, which you can use to contribute towards the life of the church. But what your tithing does is allow the ministry to happen in Brody Valley Church, in the valley, amongst its own people. And so I've invited three ladies from one of the ladies' life groups to come and join us this morning. Uh, Bev, Cynthia, Nettie, thank you for joining us. And they're going to just spend a couple of minutes just sharing with us about what their life group that they're part of means to them. And so, Bev, if you want to go first. Well, the life group is very important to me. I'm connecting with people, um, sharing sharing the gospel, the gospel. And not only that, it, it just keeps your spirits high um, mm. during these COVID times and you know it, you can't meet. It's, it's really, very important to keep connected. Thank you. Cynthia? I find it is a time in which we are there to encourage one another, to listen to each other's stories, to share our stories, and to spread the love of Jesus among our group and how we can also reach out to others who are in need. And that is what I find is very meaningful to belong to a life group. And I've belonged to a life group many years of my life. And each time I find it very enrich enriching and encouraging. And I feel that the Lord's presence and his spirit is there with us all the way. 
Mm. Thank you, Nancy. To me, life group is lifeline because we can discuss whatever happens in our lives with the ladies that we're in our group with. And we know that it goes no further, but it goes as far as the ears of him who needs to hear it. And we can pray together, cry together, laugh together. So to me, it's imperative to be part of a life group. Mm. Yeah, like that language of lifeline. And uh, so some of you may be listening to this and just realize that we are perhaps in the, the most mm. disconnected uh, period in world history. And uh, life group is just a great way to connect with other believers. Thanks, ladies. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Grant. Hey, friends. On the screen now is a QR code. I'd love you to snap scan that and contribute to the life and work and ministry of Prodi Valley Church. Uh, we love spending money to make the world a better place. And we love even more than that, spending money to make Jesus' name known to those who have not yet heard about him. We do some phenomenal things through the life of this church. We have the Renewed Trust that is involved in education, job creation and upskilling of people. We have missionaries in various places in both South Africa and internationally who are on the very front lines of taking the good news message to people and helping to create these kind of gospel communities. And then we have a bunch of ministry in and around our own community and our own neighborhood. And we would love you to partner with us. And so please do that. Uh, snap scan or do an EFT, set up a regular uh, transfer of money so that we can do the ministry to which Jesus has called us and so that we can do it well. Let me pray for us and pray for this money. Uh, Father, thank you for the gift that you've given us. Um, I know that for some it's been a tough season and yet for others it's been a season of blessing. Whether it's been good or bad, Lord, we want to give of what we have to you and ask that you would multiply it out, and that you would use it to make Jesus' name known to the very ends of the earth. And Father, no one who gives uh, to your kingdom and in your name will ever walk away disappointed. We believe that this money will be used with deep integrity and purpose by our leaders. I pray that you would give them a deep sense of accountability for it. And I pray that in the end, we would see a harvest for your kingdom, that people would come to know that Jesus is Lord and Savior and King. Amen. Friends, let me bless you. Uh, Jesus Christ is the Lord. He is the one who blesses. I get to say the words. And so may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his face towards you and give you peace. Have a great week worshiping Jesus.